Thanks for joining us. For more great content like this, visit polishingthepulpit.com or search for Polishing the Pulpit in your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to check out PTP365 for thousands of more videos just like this. You can learn more by visiting 365.polishingthepulpit.com, and to make it easy for you, we've put a link in this video's description. Good evening and welcome to the PTP team class hosted by the 70 West Church of Christ located in Hot Springs, Arkansas. During this series of studies, we're going to study the Bible ABCs. We're so encouraged that you are taking time tonight to study God's Word with us. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me this evening. I've been asked to talk to you about what I would have wanted to know when I was your age. And this is surprisingly difficult for me since, believe it or not, and I, I know I look so old, I'm actually right about your age. So I know a little bit more than others would about how you think and what makes you tick. Let's get into tonight's, into tonight's lesson. Allow me to introduce the Tater family. Now, the Taters, they are not a physical family, but more of a way of thinking, a family of thinkers, if you will. Are you with me? I, I don't think they're with me. Anyway, let's jump right into the lesson and you'll catch on. Number one, the first one's name is Spec. Spec Tater. You with me now? I don't think they're laughing. No. Spectators. This is someone who never wants to get involved. They don't teach. They don't sing. They don't pray. And they, they are not ever properly focused. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Verse 58. Therefore, stop right there. Therefore what? When we see this word therefore, it means that there's something before that that we need to understand, to understand this part of Scripture. Let's go back up to verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. Therefore, preparing for the Lord's return, therefore, my beloved brothers, stop right there. Brothers, this word is plural. Not just a few are commanded. Everyone is commanded to do this. Well, what are we commanded to do? Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding. Notice that, always abounding. This reminds me of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19-20. Go, who, all of us, where, to all nations, teaching what? All that God has commanded always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. If all we are doing is spectating, then our supposed labor is in vain because we're not actually doing anything. We are commanded, all of us, to go everywhere teaching all of what God's commanded. Second part of this. In order to get involved out there, we first need to start here. The fact that we are still young means absolutely nothing. Let's turn to 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 16. Verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given to you by prophecy, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. What we need to get out of this is that you've heard it said that we are the church of tomorrow. That is not true. We are no longer the church of tomorrow. We are the church of today. So we need to start acting like it. We need to stop spectating, and we need to get involved. Number two, agi, agitator. This is someone who always wants to be miserable, who always wants attention and stirs up just because they can. And they tell rumors and half-truths. 
Do these people sound familiar? I think they do. I think we might know just a few of them. Let's turn to Acts 13, 6 through 10. Verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? False teachers like this one that we see here had lots of the world leaders and people of significant importance wrapped around their fingers. Um, this particular false teacher had the senatorial proconsul under his sway. This false teacher, he must have known beforehand the power of the apostles' message. He saw the works that were being done, but, and he saw how the people were reacting to it, and he was afraid. He was afraid of losing control of the proconsul, so the proconsul had control of the people. So whoever had control of the proconsul had control of all the people under them. Second part of this, just because this message sounds good and has the majority of the people behind it doesn't make it true. Matthew 7, 15 through 20. If you will turn there. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Now, there's an analogy I like to make with false teachers like this. So let's say that in the beginning of this uh, passage, it says to beware of false prophets. They look good on the outside. Consider them as the leaves, and we'll get to that in a minute. You will know them by their fruit at the end of this passage. They have bad fruit. They've got the wrong fruit. The analogy I like to use for this is Bradford pear trees. Now, any of you young men that have done any sort of landscaping work, you will agree with me. Bradford pear trees, they are a beautiful tree. They are a decorative, decorative tree. But they have bad fruit, and they stink in the summertime. Um, false teachers I like to think of as Bradford pear trees. They look good on the outside, but once you start getting deeper into them, you see the bad fruit. They've got the wrong fruit. They stir up, and they seek attention, and they look good on the outside. Number three, Devis. Devis Tater. These people always tear down, they never build up, and they tell untruths, and they don't know what they're talking about, but they want to make you think that they do. Let's turn to 2 Peter 2, 18 through 19. Verse 18. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Notice in the first verse, in the first part of the verse, they have loud boasts of folly. This is how you will recognize them. And they have sensual passions and they lie. That's a key characteristic of devastators. They are persistent liars. And their prey is new Christians, guiding them down the wrong paths. In 2 Timothy 3, we can see the attributes of a devastator. So let's turn there. <clears throat> that is 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. But understand this, that in the last days there will become times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people, the latter part of verse 5. 
For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just as Jans and Jambres opposed Moses. So these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified, notice that, regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was of that of those two men. Notice, they, the attributes of devastators, we had that whole list. At the end, it says that they are corrupted in mind, and they are disqualified regarding the faith. In order to avoid devastators, we have to look to Christ and not to man. Let's go to Hebrews 11, 1 through 2. 1 through 2. Now faith, is, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their condemnation. In the, in the first part of that, we see assurance and conviction. And then in the latter part, we see what the devastators, we see the devastators. Condemnation. The devastators, they will reap their reward. Matthew 6, 2. Um, number four, lamin. Lamentators. With lamentators, there's always something wrong, and they're never involved, and they're always unhappy with something. Let's go to 1 Peter 4.16. Verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Notice it's easy for a spectator to become a lamentator. There's a pattern here. The pattern is that they're not involved. If we're not involved, it's easy to fall into this trap. The solution is to get involved today. Christianity is going to be difficult, it says in 1 Peter 4, but hang in there. Let's look at James 1, through, James 1 2 through 8. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Notice this. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So in the first part of that, we have counted all joy. We have the opposite of what a lamentator is. And then it goes into what lamentators are. They are doubting, and they're double-minded. He's saying here that you have to be one or the other, but you can't be both. There is no middle ground. Let's turn to James uh, 3.10. Verse 10. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. These things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Notice this, these questions were all rhetorical. Of course they can't. There is no, you can't, you can't be on both sides of the fence. Um, in Revelation 3, 15 through 16. Let's turn there right quick. I particularly like this one. Verse 15. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would be that you are either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Notice this. God wants nothing to do with these people. He says that it's, it's his vomit. He, he spits them out of his mouth. He wants nothing to do with them. Number five, dictators. Dictators, they always want to be in charge. And they cause ruin and they stir up again just because they can. Let's look at 3 John 9 through 10. Verse 9, but I have written something to the church. But Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. What authority? By what authority do they have? In 2 Corinthians 13, 10, we find that the authority is from God. Let's continue. 
So, I will, so if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who wants to and puts them out of the church. The main reason for splits in the Lord's church today is over a power struggle. Someone wants their own way regardless of what anyone else thinks and regardless of what God says. Notice in verse 10, John will confront Diotrephes. And if you noticed in the latter part of that, that Diotrephes, he prevented people from coming to Christ. God specifically and repeatedly states to avoid these kinds of people. In Romans 16, 17 through 18, let's turn there right quick. Romans 16, 17 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. Notice it says, watch out for such people and avoid them. And again, in 2 Timothy 3, we've already been there, it says in the latter parts of verse 5 or 6, to avoid such people. Number 6, common, commentators. We all know these kinds of people. These people, they always give bad advice, and they're full of comments and critiques, and they want everyone else to do when they do not. Let's turn to Proverbs 25, 9. Proverbs 25, 9. Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another's secret. Don't love to criticize is what, it was what we're trying to get out of this here. If someone comes to you in confidence, don't go telling the whole world about it. Let's turn to Matthew 23, 2 through 3. 2 through 3. And let's start in verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so practice and do whatever they tell you. But not what they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. The scribes and the Pharisees here, they taught and interpreted the law correctly. So do and observe whatever they tell you about the law not about their traditions that they've made up. Notice they preach, but do not practice their traditions. They added to God's word. We can see that in Deuteronomy 4, 2. Do not add to God's word. Deuteronomy 12, 32, the same thing. Do not add. Also found in the latter part of the last chapter of Revelation. Do not add or take away to God's word. Number seven, Emma. If your name is Emma, this isn't specifically talking about you Maybe. Emma. Imitators. This is someone, notice this is not someone who imitates what they should be doing, imitating Christ. This is someone who follows the wrong crowd. Ephesians 4, 14. It is Ephesians 4, 14. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We cannot follow the crowd. And I know that every one of you have heard this phrase because either your mama told you, or your daddy told you, or you've probably told it to somebody else. If your friend jumps off a cliff, would you? I know, I'm, I'm cringy and yes. But that is exactly what it's talking about here. We are supposed to be different, and we are held to a higher standard. Notice verse 17 and 18. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the fertility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of their heart. We are supposed to be different. We are held to a higher standard than the world is. Number eight, meditator. Now, again, this is someone who does not meditate on God's word like they should be doing, but meditates on thinking about becoming a stronger Christian, but never actually does, and makes excuses upon excuses upon excuses. Let's look at Luke 14, 28. 
For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all those who see it begin to mock him. The church, it was designed with a purpose. Let's turn to Ephesians 3.10. Ephesians 3.10. So the church was designed for a purpose. What is that purpose? 310. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might, might now be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly places. The manifold wisdom of God is made known through the church. Now, man, in general, he thinks that he is smart. And we try to use earthly logic to describe things that we don't understand. Well, God's commands, they might not always make sense to us at the present time. But nonetheless, we are still commanded to do them whether we understand them or not. We are still commanded to do them. Number nine, hesit, hesitators. Now, if I hadn't talked about you yet, I guarantee you that I'm probably talking to you now because even this one is hard for me. I, I, can, I can conquer all these other ones and not be like all these other people, but even for me, it's extremely difficult because I am the world's biggest procrastinator that you have ever met. And don't challenge me on that because I'll prove you wrong. Hesitators. They never choose and they can't decide. They know that they are wrong, but they won't do anything about it. And they're self-justifiers, and I, I'm the biggest self-justifier out there. Let's turn to Acts 26. This is talking about King Agrippa. Verse 27. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also but all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Paul here knew Agrippa believed and knew that Agrippa knew the scriptures. But Agrippa was a hesitator. Let's look at James 4.17. And I know I am getting close on time, and we are almost there. James 4.17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Notice that. When we know what's right, for us it is sin. Uh, let's look at... 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It is 1 Corinthians 15, 52. And we've already read it, but we'll read it again. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Let's look at Matthew 24, 27 and 27. That is Matthew 24, 27. Verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. We do not know when the Lord is coming back. This means that we need to have an urgency about us. This is of utmost importance. We cannot be a hesitator. We cannot hesitate. We cannot procrastinate about this because we don't know when the Lord is coming back. To some, this means procrastination. And I'm as guilty of it as anybody else is. So let's ask ourselves this evening. When we go home tonight and we're sleeping in our beds, 
whose last name will we bear? Will it be Steve, George, Jones, Pogue? Or will it be Tater? Thank you. Thank you for studying with us this evening. Join us again next Friday at 7 p.m. for the next installment of the PTP Teen Bible Study, Bible ABCs.